Hey guys, so before we get into today's video, I wanted to ask if you have had the chance to check out Quick Media on YouTube. Greg Matson is one of my favorite Latter-day Saint commentators about how current events and culture interface with the church and its institutions. A BYU protest took place this week, part of a national protest. Post in this episode, we are talking about what I call President Nelson's identity hierarchy that the church is reacting to a trend in in history where Greg understands well the ideological forces at play in today's society and he does a great job of breaking down how faithful Latter-day Saints should frame the crazy world that we live in so check him out just search for quick media that C W I C media on YouTube and be sure to subscribe Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this continuing conversation with my good friend, Luke Hansen. Luke, how you doing? Hey, I'm fired up. Let's do this. Let's keep it going. <laughs> so we are reviewing the political philosophy of Nuance Ho, uh, who went on the Zelf and the Shelf channel. I think it was on their channel. Maybe it was on hers. And uh, they began to talk about political. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, they, they went on and basically talked about uh, about. Uh, leftism and politics and why they basically all have moved into what is essentially uh, pretty far left activism. In the last video, we talked a little, uh, you know, about various things about conservatism. We talked about uh, the difference between positive uh, freedoms, freedom from or freedom to, um, and some of those differences. Um, and we're just going to continue rolling through some of these clips. So uh, I'm gonna pull up uh, the next one. Do you, it's about uh, God complex is the title on it. Do you any preface that you want to give this video, or should we just roll right into it? Uh, uh, so once again, this is gonna be them having pulled up a clip from the article and reading it and responding to it, and basically trying to, like they've done before, throw back the accusation that this author and the Federalist makes against the left, trying to throw it back and say, no, it's the right that has that same problem with the God complex. So sounds yep. good. Let's jump in. Profoundly, most conservatives have a healthier understanding of God's relation to the world vis-a-vis -vis Jesus. Because they see Jesus as the embodied God, they see a clear line where God ends and they begin. And Is the it, realm of so human it's basically capacity. saying conservatives don't have a God complex, but I mean... That sounds like one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the functional reality of evangelical Christianity is believing that your beliefs your specific way of viewing the world I you'd love this is so endorsed by god that you can justify poverty famine wars and not helping people apparently because jesus is gonna yes. i mean like what is more of a god com you can't just say oh i don't have a god complex because god is actually on my side in it i got okay so basically let me just sum up what they're saying real quick they're saying that you know uh the article is claiming that leftists have a God complex because they want to like shape the world according to their whims. And they're saying, no, nah, conservatives, you have a God complex because you think that, oh, we're like God's chosen people and, you know, God's on our side, more or less. Mm -hmm. Any other, any, did I miss anything? I want to make sure we kind of steel man it. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't know if this is, I, I think what she's trying to say there at the end is, they have this concept of the will to power on the left, uh, especially on the left. And because basically in their mind, utopia is achievable. Like Marx laid this out when they talk about history or like being on the right side of history, they see history as a science and they see implementing the proper uh, procedures into the science experiment we're running can come with the outcome of the Marxist utopia, what we would see as Zion. And so the all we're missing is the will to power. Um, Zion is achievable. Utopia is in front of us. And all we have to do is get those damn conservatives to stop thinking that they're so cool and that Jesus is going to save them, whatever, and get them to vote for the darn free health care and the darn, you know, free pu public transport and all these other things that are sitting there right in front of us that we can go out and grab whenever we need them. 
and then we can achieve utopia. And because we're not doing that, because we're stubbornly saying, no, God's on our side, this is what he's doing. I think that's what, she didn't quite articulate it this way, but I think the worldview that this is coming from, this is um, how it's manifesting, what she's saying. I think the idea is we have this God complex of we are the ones suppressing humanity by not dis by deciding not to progress into the future because ba basically then we become God because now we have the power of life and death in our hands and we're choosing death because we're not voting for these policies that are going to bring salvation to mankind. It is interesting to look at it, how religious this sort of worldview is. When you think about it, they talk about progress. Well, progress towards what? There has to be at least conceptually some idea in their head of what is essentially heaven, a utopia, a, a state where mankind kind of how far can you take this progress? And and they're they're trying to work towards it, right? This is something that is very religious in its orientation. Now, Marx had a very specific idea, you know, the Marxian utopia is a very specific thing, but regardless. They're just saying, we just need to keep making progress, keep making things better. And this impulse that views history and views human action and behavior on this moral progress versus regress is a way of orienting the world according to a religious framework. And according to, not only that, what I would argue is a Christian framework, right? They don't want any more. They, they're, they're yearning for Zion is what they're yearning for. A society with no poor where everyone gets along and loves each other and, and kind of perfect harmony. But what their, their idea is, is we need to build Zion ourselves. Like we're the ones who are going to build it. And there's, there's two things. There's the vision of the utopia or their version of Zion. Like what does that look like? And then there is how do we get there? And I also want to I want to hit on this idea of the leftist idea is liberation. It's expressive individualism is kind of the way that most of them view this. It's the perfect society is one in which it doesn't matter what you do. You just get to do whatever you want so long as you're not hurting someone else. And there is no moral virtue or right way to live your life do whatever you will just as long as it doesn't harm others. So it's kind of this perverse sort of mm -hmm. mixture of Christian values and satanic values, do whatever the heck you want, <laughs> kind of mixed in together into this utopian vision that they have. And then they want to use the instruments of violence and coercion, the state to engineer this, this utopian world. Is that kind of the way mm -hmm. you see it? I, I do, yes. And we're going to see it. these people seem to be very Marxist, kind of more, <laughs> I, maybe I would even say conservative Marxist, because it's more of a <laughs> traditional Marxian view rather than the, the neo-Marxist uh, postmodern view that's in the world right now with all the critical theories going on. Um, and but real if, quick, if can you I, go and well, look at Marx, yeah. I was just going to say one thing too on the on the thing of the god complex they feel like they can build this world the way that it should be where our view is is that we because we're fallen and flawed creatures we can't do it ourselves it is only through some sort of a submission to a higher power to something transcendent mm -hmm. that it can emerge and frankly that's a huge difference because they're saying that essentially everyone gets to do what they want and then society will all be good. But society won't be all good if everyone does whatever the heck they want. Like it, it's sort of like saying we're going to get a bunch of different musical instruments together and we're all going to play a different song at the same time. Just play whatever you want. It's like there is no order where we say there's a transcendent order and then all of us will bring our different instruments to the to the choir and then we'll play this beautiful song. But they sort of reject the idea of there being a song. And it's just like, no, you just get to go here and we're all going to get together and the world's going to be all of us playing whatever we want. But that only leads to noise and conflict because 
you don't live in a vacuum. And ultimately, if I am making terrible choices in my life that quote unquote only affect me, the problem is, is that if everyone around me is sitting around doing drugs and watching porn and playing video games all day and aren't being productive, good citizens, that, that affects me. <laughs> Cause like mm -hmm. I live in a society, you know what I'm saying? And so, yeah. And if you're going to take the positive freedoms approach from the previous video, you could say that those people are impinging upon your positive freedom, you know, to the freedom to, you can't educate yourself if you're not living in a sober and educated society. Or so you, so you can actually kind of use these same concepts uh, against them. Yeah, absolutely. And they, and, and they just don't work. <laughs> and we, like we and, have enough blood all over the world to say these ideas don't work. Yeah. And we're social animals. We're, we're social animals. And even like babies, they had some babies in, in a, um, I almost said an abortion facility, but in a, <laughs> what's, what's the place <laughs> called with, with parentless children? Nursery, uh, uh orphanage. Um, uh, there we go. There's the word orphanage. Um, uh, well taken care of medically, but all these babies were dying because they weren't getting the human contact that even babies in other uh, facilities were getting. And and the irony actually is, is they had put up curtains and were wearing surgical gloves to try and stop the spread of disease. But what they also stopped was the spread of human connection and empathy to like babies. Like they don't talk or anything, but they were dying from the lack of that. And so we can't just live as our own individualistic selves where we have tolerance and everything's going to work out fine when that happens. It, it actually isn't because we do need to live with each other, you can't independently be happy of everybody else by you doing you. And actually, I just finished a, a rather famous book from the turn of the century called Bowling Alone by Robert Putnam. And he tracks this and kind of the surprising thing that comes out is as tolerance increased, social capital, the, the amount of time we're getting together in clubs, uh, formally and informally, the amount of the amount of op-eds we're writing, our engagement with the political system, all these things, went down as the tolerance and acceptance of just kind of like a you do you type of thing increased. And, yeah. and once again, Zion is that paradox. And, and C.S. Lewis talked about this is as you become more and more like Christ, it would seem like you're getting more and more uniform, but you actually get more and more unique. And evil actually becomes more uniform, even though it's preaching the do what thou wilt, that shall be, that shall be the whole of the law. And this is what they talked about with the Nazi concentration caps, the banality of evil. It's just so, it, it's so monotone. It's like, I, I think you've posted this on Twitter too. It's like, ooh, you're so special. You're fighting against the system and you've got the same blue hair. You've got the same tattoos. You've got the same unkempt, unfit appearance. You say the same mean things about all of the institutions you don't like. And, and it just turns into a, yeah, the banality of evil. Well, and so it's the paradox. Is... As we become more one, we do find that individual joy, that an individual expression of ourselves as we're, we're making a Zion society. And it doesn't seem like it will work because it won't without Christ. But with him, it, it does work. And I, I'm excited because it sounds like it's going to be a beautiful thing. And, and the hints that we've seen with it on earth that people have been able to achieve in small measures so far have been really beautiful as well. Yeah. And, and see, the thing is, is that when, so there's this notion in critical theory and hard leftism and kind of in their vision of liberation, right? Um, I'm going to pull up just the word here I got to put on the screen because this is an important concept to recognize. This is essentially the expressive individualist worldview. It's where it's sort of do what thou wilt is the philosophy behind this. The idea is, is that liberty for the sake of liberty is the highest good where we as Latter-day Saints and um, in the Western tradition have said liberty exists for the purpose of virtue because liberty is a precondition for virtue. You cannot choose virtue unless you choose it freely. And that's a big deal. And I'm, I'm going to repeat that. You can't be coerced into virtue. Virtue must be chosen. And so if we want a virtuous society, a good society, 
people have to be free as a prerequisite to get that. Okay. Because coerced virtue is no virtue at all. Okay. Now, the reason virtue matters is because virtue is like the it's like the oil that that greases the machine of human interactions. When you're dealing with virtuous people, we don't need anyone coercing us. We we harmonize voluntarily our interactions with one another. And it's beautiful. It's what a family is. That's what all of your best interactions, the, world, the things that matter most to everyone are relationships with other people. And relationships are predicated on laws that govern those relationships. Meta, and I'm not talking political laws. I'm talking about social and metaphysical realities of the way that we're supposed to treat each other. And so if you fully go to this radical notion of liberation, you say there are no rules that govern how you should behave, except for don't, don't directly hurt someone else. The problem is, is that you do hurt someone else because you don't live in a vacuum. Human beings don't. And so if we're going to live in a society, there must be, is, or I guess you could pose the question, is there an ideal way for humans to interact with one another? And if there is, then that is what we should want people to abide, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why I use this orchestra analogy. I think when you're talking about your uniqueness, Christianity will help you to understand the nature of your particular instrument that you have to play. But then it harmonizes all of the instruments together into the most beautiful song in the world. Mm -hmm. And that's why there is truth that diversity is a strength, but it's only a strength within a greater unity. Diversity for the sake of diversity is a bunch of people with instruments that are all just making noise with their instruments however they want. But also, if you don't, if everyone has the exact same instrument, it doesn't create an orchestra sound, right? And so their idea, it's its a bastardized concept of Zion. They're, they're, they're moving in the right direction, right? They want um, human beings to harmonize and live together well and, and have the best relationships possible, but they don't recognize that radical liberation isn't what leads to that. Righteousness and virtue is. That's the point of righteousness and virtue. So that was my yeah, rant. <laughs> I, and, and this is something that I have learned from this conversation, uh, thinking about this a little more deeply as you've talked about it. That symphony analogy is, is beautiful. Like, like that's awesome. It, I would say as somebody who likes that kind of music more than like the more uh, contemporary pop kind of stuff, maybe this is a, a point in favor of, you know, in defense of classical music is you have all these people, like the Mormon Tabernacle Choir with the orchestra, uh, with John Williams conducting Call of the Champions. <laughs> Listen to it to help put my kids to sleep last night. Um, all these people, you know, you have a couple hundred choir members. I don't know how many parts that song is. Maybe it's four, maybe it's six. You have the French horns, you have the flutes, you have the conductor, and they have got to be lockstep. It's very constrictive. Like you don't get to decide that you're playing in three four when it's four four. You don't get to decide that it's a crescendo when it's a decrescendo, or that you're speeding up when you're actually slowing down, or that we're actually not going to hold this fermata. We're going to keep. You do not get to decide any of that. You have got to be in conformity with the hundreds of people around you, and it, that sounds like it's going to be super depressing and the lockstep, and I don't get to express myself individually. But once you get to that point, you kind of create like a little mini Zion in sort of an abject, abstract sense, because it's it's music instead of your actual life. But my goodness, the music that can come out of disciplined and professional symphonies, oh, Beethoven sixth, uh, some of the stuff from Mozart, Holtz, the planets, Jupiter, like it's even and some of the Star Wars music and stuff, like it is, it is amazing. And I think and it's we... sort of a microcosm an abstraction of Zion that we can learn from. I agree. And I use that example all the time for that reason. And yeah, I great. think what the thing that happens is we're inviting people to voluntarily take up their instrument and play the music, not whatever they want, but to play the music that we're all trying to play. 
right? That's the call to Zion. That's the call to, 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 to Christ. He's trying to gather us all together so that we can play the song that he wants us all to play. And what's funny is we've done this in our own lives. Zion emerges to the degree that we live in accordance with that order. You get these happy families and these, and these communities that take care of each other. And it, Zion starts in your own life individually as you conform yourself to this song. And then it, but it expands because then it, it transforms the relationship between you and your wife and then you and your children. And like this four stage of the priesthood, it expands from the inside out. And there's the, the if we're, if we're talking about Zion, the greatest, I think Zion quote that's out there of all time is from, um, from Ezra Taft Benson. This is what, this is the point. It's not that we impose this from the outside through the coercion of the state. Instead, as he said, the Lord works from the inside out. The world works from the outside in. The world would take people out of the slums. Christ takes the slums out of people, and then they take themselves out of the slums. The world would mold men by changing their environment. Christ changes men who then change their environment. The world would shape human behavior, but Christ can change human nature. So the method of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the doctrine of Christ is to work from the inside out. But I think we'll see as we continue to watch these clips, their approach is to utilize the power of the state to impose their particular vision of Zion onto the world through coercion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. And I think the way that the conversation where it's at right now, it'd be good to play clip number nine next. Okay. okay, we'll go straight to clip number nine right now. So here's them saying that the right is actually the ones that need Jesus. And they're Sorry. reading an article that's kind of making this case, I believe, as part of this clip. Here we go. I'll say, as a Christian, I think everybody could gain much by having a relationship with Jesus, but I think the left can teach Christians like myself very much in terms of their willingness to speak in a courageous way to the least of these, instead of just working in the prisons, just working in the, the small scale ways that Christians want to go into places and try to better them. But what can we actually do as a country in a wide scale? They're like, it's not the government's job to forcibly implement the actual practical vision, okay? Right. And they're but like, they well, who is the job? Well, it's the individual's <laughs> job, it's the church's job. And then you're like, okay, so you're gonna use that tax, that tax exempt money, billions of dollars that you've earned on your televangelist channel, you're gonna use that to help the poor? And they're like, well, that's not my responsibility. You know, each person has to do it on their own. And it's like, great. So what you're arguing for is a world where nobody is helped and the Christian vision isn't implemented in any meaningful way whatsoever. <laughs> So basically they're saying you have a good idea, but you're not implementing it through the government. Or, or implementing it the way, that useless. We, the way that we think it should be implemented. Like, we, yeah. so we're going to use force because you're not doing it right. We're going to use force to do it right. It's like, you're not giving enough to charity. So I'm going to come to your house with a gun and I'm going to make you give more to charity. Mm-hmm. And now, the now this would all be that. this would all be well and good if they kind of had a leg to stand on. But when we look, uh, here's some Pew Research data we've got going on for 2014. Uh, for doing volunteer work in the past seven days, Americans who attended church regularly, we have 45%. So in the past week, 45% said, yes, I did volunteer work. Other Americans, the ones who are not overtly religious, was 27%. It's almost half. Uh, gave to the poor in the past week. Americans who attended church regularly, 65%. Other Americans, 41%. And here's a quote from the same article. Mormons are the most generous Americans, both by participation level and size of gifts. Evangelical Christians are next. And mind you, these are the two main groups that they're having a problem with in this video. Then come mainline Protestants, Catholics lag both. Jews give higher do dollar amounts on average because they have higher earnings while trailing Protestants give in donations a share, while trailing Protestant givers in donations as a share of income. So on a per capita income basis, uh, Mormons, as we were called back then, and evangelicals are actually leading the pack. And so it's kind of weird. And, and I'm not saying I give more than you as like a one-to-one -one level, but when we're comparing the two populations, it just seems like a really weird and 
you should think twice before giving that critique if the data don't back up what you're trying to say on an individual giving level. And and that's I think that's totally true. And my thing is this though. But at what point do you say that well I get to go and make you like the, if you believe in liberation and freedom well no you don't. You believe in making people do what you want them to do according to what you think they should do and you are willing to impose your moral system on others by violent force through the state. Like I'm sorry like you're not on the t- on the side of of actual liberty. This is why this desire to create utopia pulls out of people the authoritarian impulse is is because mm-hmm. well people aren't doing it okay so are you going to go and persuade them like we do sending missionaries to ask them to change their lives to repent and to live better and to be more generous and to be less selfish and then actually have them do it like we've shown through these statistics <laughs> <laughs> and and basically all the Christians, are you going to join in that movement that's asking people to voluntarily change themselves? Or are you going to go with a gun and say, you have to do what we say? We make the rules around here. Now, I, is there some level to which I can say that I believe in some level of coercive force that can be justified in certain instances? You know, that's a whole conversation to have. But in principle, that would be a necessary evil at best. They're not saying it's a necessary evil. They're saying this is how we get things done. And if I can play clip uh, number um, seven about Probably politics, seven. Yes. yeah, politics being all we so have. So this I is think, kind of the this is kind of the peak. This is the culmination of this worldview. What it what it arrives at. Politics are all we have. Politics are all we have, and we have a country established by the people and for the people, and. If the kingdom of God is supposed to be a good thing, uh, why put it off for the next life? Why can't we use political action now to pressure our politicians to do the things that secure more rights and freedoms for people? That what other means do we have besides politics to actually implement policies that move you towards the type of country that you want to have? There are, this article says <clears throat> political movement that is for people who don't believe hard enough in jesus because all you need in terms of movement is jesus to the cross to heaven and you're done politics is all we have what Mm -hmm. what else could there be to create a society like if we can't use coercive force to make people do what we want i don't know maybe persuasion Maybe respecting other people, love unfeigned, <laughs> repentance, righteousness. Like the the idea is, is that going back to that analogy of the um, of the symphony, it's like pointing a gun at someone and saying, "You're going to play exactly what we want you to play, and we determine what the song is, and you got to play it the way that we want." Versus someone saying, "Hey, we have a beautiful song, and if you come and you practice and you discipline what you're doing and you pay attention." Like we're going to create something amazing. And like I said, like I, I actually real quick, just cause I know that you'll have a lot to say on this too, but there's a great clip from, um, elder Christofferson, um, where he talks about this sort of reliance on the government that exists out there. As a consequence, self-discipline has eroded. And societies are left to try to maintain order and civility by compulsion. The lack of internal control by individuals breeds external control by governments. One columnist observed that gentlemanly behavior, for example, once protected women from coarse behavior. Today, we expect sexual harassment laws to restrain coarse behavior. Policemen and laws can never replace customs, traditions, and moral values as a means for regulating human behavior. At best, the police and criminal justice system are the last desperate line of defense for a civilized society. Our increased reliance on laws to regulate behavior is a measure of how uncivilized we've become. Ooh. (laughs) <laughs> that was so good. 
So how, yep. you know, it's when you're relying on the government for everything, like instead of freely chosen virtuous living, we're not a civilized people anymore. We're literally walking around telling each other what to do, or we're going to hit each other. And that's the only way you can get people to cooperate and work together as a human society. Like that's really, that's what she thinks. Like politics is all we have. And how else are we going to get people to cooperate and live in harmony? <laughs> yeah. And this is uh, Robert Putnam points out the same thing as social capital declined from like the sixties to the late nineties. When the book was written, the amount of lawyers per capita increased a lot because the, the handshake was was not working as a legal contract anymore. You had to put a lot more external course of controls in place because the virtuous internal controls of the society weren't doing the job anymore. And and the ironic thing is, is that if you're looking to the government as the thing that can impose morality on a society, then that means that the more immoral a society becomes, the more government becomes necessary. Yeah. But because government is taken from those same immoral people that are creating the immoral society that needs fixing, the government becomes less capable to fix the society the more you dem the more it is needed to fix society in this mm -hmm. worldview. And so it, it actually becomes unworkable because it's good at doing what you need it to do when you actually don't need it to do what you want it to do. And then it's going to be really bad at doing what you need it to do when you actually need it to do what you want it to do. Well, isn't that isn't that sort of the whole thing of Solzhenitsyn when he talks about this idea that everyone oh, I was going to bring that up. <laughs> OK, if you want if you want to go for it. But but my my basic thing with Solzhenitsyn is, is he talks about evil running through every human heart. And yeah. that I've was got the, the quote right here. Yeah, go, go ahead. And, well, let me just to contextualize it a little mm -hmm. bit. Solzhenitsyn was a um, a Russian reformer who basically saw the evils of communism in his country, but he had a really interesting take on it because most people blame the leaders were the bad guys. And Solzhenitsyn boldly kind of said, no, it was actually all of our fault. It was us as a Russian people. We stopped telling the truth. We basically lost virtue. And we be, be, when you lose virtue as a society and the government is the one who's going to impose the virtue, as the virtue of the society goes down and down, you need more and more government until you have a totally totalitarian state with a totally unvirtuous people who won't who will just lie about everything. And I, I don't know if that'll contextualize some of the some of the quote that you're going to give. Yeah, yeah. And he he wrote the the specific quote of what you're saying is the line between good and evil runs not through states, nor between classes, nor between political parties either, which I think is kind of what uh, the self on the shelf and nuance so people are saying. But he continues, but runs through every human heart. And so that's what you contend with first. And going back to the statistics on who's giving and who's not giving, I, I, that's kind of the irony here is that uh, the left, or at least <clears throat> as represented by the people in this video, are saying, you people are m messed up because you're trying to defer your responsibility onto Jesus. And so you're just refusing to make progress in society. And it's, oh, Jesus and the cross, and we're going to be Which saved. Which is a total lie. Great. Jesus is telling us to take the responsibility <laughs> on ourselves and to be as he would be in the world. Sorry. But even if that is the case... You are deferring the responsibility from yourself because you're giving less, you're donating less, you're uh, getting in there and volunteering less with people and deferring it onto the power of the state, which is essentially your functional replacement for Jesus and God to do that for you. So it's, it's a hypocrisy because you're accusing us of that which you are actually doing. It, it's true. But uh, truly the caveat perverse. is this does not mean we're perfect. Oh, of course I'm, not. Yeah. Sure. I, I would not be a good citizen in Zion if it existed right now. I'd need to work on some stuff. And that's kind of the point of mortality. I think you would make the same concession. And if you yeah, don't, absolutely. I would make it for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, no, I'm, I'm too selfish and I have my my biases yeah. and problems myself. Mm -hmm. But, but we I can, think well, you start I, with that. Well, and Zion emerges. It's not like all of a sudden one day Zion happens. It's you can be closer or farther from Zion. And we all know that 
you've been in a personal relationship with God that was closer or farther from the Zion relationship with God. You've had a social relationship with your wife because Zion is all about the, the social relationships, right? And idealizing those, right? Getting on the same wavelength. And when you're all on the same wavelength with your spouse, life can be really good. Now expand that to your children. Now your wife, your children, and, and you've been closer to that or you've been farther from it. We all have. And we all know that those are the most painful or most beautiful things in our life. And then you expand that out to, okay, can I build Zion in my ward? Can I build Zion in my stake? Can I build Zion in the greater community? And there's this outward thing where we, and I always say it this way, you make government irrelevant. Like he said, you if the more unvirtuous, the more vice a society has in it, the more you need coercion to kind of correct the problem. But the exact opposite is true. It isn't that we're going to go and knock down the government with a hammer. We're not going to be like the zealots and pull out the sword and go get Caesar. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to make it so it's no longer even needed. It's just like, do you need police when people don't commit crimes? <laughs> Mm -hmm. You know, like eventually yeah. it's just, it just becomes super, uh, su superfluous. And, and that is why I believe Zion emerges. And what we see is the exact opposite is what, when people utilize the authoritarian state to impose their values, that's the exact opposite course of Zion. It's just showing that we're moving in the wrong direction. And I think one of the reasons that the, the Constitution is divinely inspired is because the Constitution specifically is trying to minimize the power of the state to impose its will and to give people freedom and then to empower, without the government corrupting religion, to empower private institutions to institute virtue into a society so that the government can become less and less needed. It's a, it's a political system that's designed to make itself as irrelevant as possible, as small as possible. And that is the impulse toward Zion. And therefore, that's the way I see it on kind of the, the bigger level. That's why the Constitution is so inspiring, inspired as a political philosophy and, and, and system. And before a critique that they made is kind of like the deadness, like, oh, you just think the world's going to crash and burn and that's such a depressing system. It's like, well, no, because this emphasis on moral agency is the power to the people that they always talk about doing. It is workers of the world unite in its uh, more uh, godlike <laughs> or Christlike sense. It is, no, you have the power. The line between good and evil runs through your heart. And the government's mm. not going to come in here and make you good or evil. And, and what did Jesus of control is with yourself. And what did and, Jesus and, say? He said in the in his prayer to his father, he said, "Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven." The idea mm -hmm. was is that we are going to make the world more heavenly by faith, repentance, and aligning ourselves with the great orchestra, the great song that God's trying to play that we would call the spirit of God that can teach us and basically teach us the music and help us to play. Right. Um, and it's, so good. yeah, the, the idea that the idea that we're not trying to change the world, both empirically is false and theologically is false. Um, mm -hmm. because that's, that's just bred into the Christian tradition is to go out into this world and talk to every living creature and to tell them to repent and to align themselves with this, this way of being in the world that produces demonstrably produces the highest levels of human well-being that we've ever seen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We've run the experiments and, yeah. and America going back to what they said in a previous video where they're like, Oh, America was this new revolutionary thing. Uh, not really. Actually, they, they were actually trying to get back to, uh, principles like the Magna Carta. You want a real revolutionary thing that tried to ditch religion and tried to, we don't need to think about it. We don't need to pretend that the, that's yeah. what the constitution was. We have that example. That was the French revolution. Yep. There was blood in the streets. There was guillotines going in day in and day out. Yep. Uh, that's going a great tale point. of two cities. Uh, like we we've done this and we, we've tried the communism. We've, we've tried the pure rationalism, liberty, equality, fraternity. We've tried that stuff. 
and, yeah. and it hasn't worked and maybe we should go try Zion now. Yep. That's a great, that's a great point. Um, so I, we're getting down to think, it on time. What, uh, are yeah, we, any... we kind of skipped around on some stuff and I, I actually think we've basically covered everything. Awesome. If we want to, we can play number 10, which is just kind of like a nice ending of here's a couple of things that they've said that we would agree with as a common ground to end it. Or we could just end it here by being on the moral <laughs> <Let's>, high ground. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's do this real quick. We'll wrap it up with uh, with this one with some of the common ground. So uh, we'll wrap this up kind of quick here. All right. Okay. So let me uh, get the video ready. All righty rule of any any formal debate is that you have to be able to explain your your enemy your opponent's position better than they can you have to understand it so that you can break it down this is obviously a person who's never ever stepped into the mindset of an actual leftist is just totally projecting right. i just feel like my okay so, uh, what so that guy said. <laughs> i would i would disagree with that very last part but he does make an excellent point. I don't think he demonstrated that point very well throughout the video. He was always <laughs> jumping in with snide remarks that were like complete non sequiturs. Oh, but it is true. Try and understand the arguments first. And you've pointed that out multiple times. So he does do a good job of pointing that out. But I think the, the author of this article did at least try and represent the other side. Oh, and I, I hope people I hope people actually go um, on my website. I have a couple of blogs of why social justice warriors are right where I steel man their position as if I were one of them. And I actually sent it to several of my like really radical leftist friends and they loved it. They thought they're like, wow, this is really good. Go. <laughs> so I actually go. tested that. I wanted to make sure I understood them. So I wasn't misrepresenting their, their point of view um, as much as I could. And like I said before, um, Zelf on the shelf, nuance ho, you guys are welcome to come on. I would love to have a conversation with you about this stuff. Um, understand your perspective more. Um, always welcome on the channel. I can't say I was super impressed with what was on that video, but but like I said, I'm I'm always willing to have that uh, that conversation. Uh, Luke, anything uh, else before we wrap this one up? Uh, I just actually like um, after that point in the clip what they said, so maybe we can yeah. kind of have a yeah. kumbaya playing the rest of let's, that together. Let's uh, let's let's go ahead and do that. Said I bet if I spoke to him about it, he would say that I was completely mischaracterizing him and doesn't think that way, but that, that's what I'm able to take away from what we just read. I just think we should always take how we feel after consuming this content and go do some, just something Let's nice for someone. Let's go eat some flesh and blood of Christ. <laughs> Even if you are a conservative, go do something me. nice for another conservative that you like and tolerate. Like, just someone, just Aww. everyone do something nice for someone, please, because stuff like this, it's really easy to just feel hopeless. And I don't know, it's I just agree. all pretty depressing. And I do worry with making content like this that it's just like more likely to trigger a backfire effect than do anything good and you never really know. And that's kind of part of content creation. And my heart is with people like my parents, people like my family, working class people who their religion affords them a lot of spiritual growth and a lot of opportunities to serve in their community. And so that's still the person that I am always for. Yeah, so I, I like that stuff. Um, if if it's just about who's right on the YouTube videos, then not going to be very productive. Go out and do something nice for somebody. Uh, talk to them respectfully about your different positions and compare them, or just do generalized service. That has nothing to do with advocating a specific philosophy. And then same thing with what Nuanceo said at the very end. Um, I think most people do have good intentions. And they just go awry. And recognizing that is going to be a good step towards making progress on explaining these issues and getting the proper mindset and theology out there into the world. Awesome. Well, good stuff, Luke. I think uh, I think we we hit this one uh, pretty hard. And I think uh, I hope I hope everyone who's watching uh, enjoyed it. I enjoyed uh, hanging with you. And if you've uh, made it to the end. Yeah, if you made it to the end, you guys are awesome. So anyway, thanks so much, Luke, for, for coming on. It's been great. Appreciate it. Thank you. So do you enjoy the content here on Thoughtful Faith? If so, be sure to hit the notification bell. This ensures that our new videos show up on your feed. Also, be sure to check out our Facebook group called Thoughtful Saints, where myself and others discuss the sorts of topics found on this channel. 
And lastly, if you think other people would benefit from this video, please be sure to share it.